In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zwijger livecast. A very good um, afternoon and welcome to the 14th edition of Uncovering Creatives. My name is Jürgen Schonnefong and I will be your moderator today. Film, music, design, visual arts, photography, fashion, theatre. Every corner of our city is buzzing with creative makers. But who are these makers? Who are the makers of today that make an impression? Who are the front runners that leave their mark on the creative scene of Amsterdam and beyond? Um, during Uncovering Creatives, we cover the stories of these creative frontrunners and we will spend the next hour talking to our guest about creatorship, entrepreneurship, creative identity and social themes. And I'm very happy to announce that our next guests are joining me here in the studio. First, we've got Miles O'Mealy. He's a footwear designer and founder of Areti. Uh, that's a foodware brand, isn't it? It's a company, actually. I mean, we don't actually create product for ourselves, but we are a company that creates product for other brands. And we'll, we'll talk yeah. about that yeah. later okay. as well. Yeah. I would like to hear more about yeah. that. And our other guest, Ms. Esme Wagemans, she's a sci-fi artist. What is a sci-fi <laughs> artist? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Um, for me, it's, I think, very sort of logical because um, people always ask for, hey, what do you do and how do you call it? And then I thought, okay, I have to use something that makes it a bit easier. And science fiction is, of course, uh, a genre um, about the future or about made-up stories or based on the future in a fiction way. So I thought it's sort of the same as what I do. It feels the same for me. Great. So, yeah. We will learn a lot about that later as well. Uh, but first, Miles, I would like to start with you because... You call yourself a footwear engineer. Yeah. yeah what, what, yeah. Why is the footwear engineer? Um, I mean, it all starts with like my interests and and when I was growing up, what I was really interested in. And uh, so when I was younger, I was really interested, fascinated with how things how things are made, how things are constructed, like taking things apart, understanding like how it's built, and this could be anything, you know, um, any product. It wasn't necessarily specific into into footwear. Um, but were you this kid that, you know, took everything apart? Yeah, literally, literally. <laughs> just, and were you just, also the kid that could put it back together or was that a problem? I mean, that was a progress, you know, <laughs> just like learning how things are took apart, for, like learning how things are made first by taking apart and then building it back together. So just fascinated by just how things are made, how things are constructed, like the technical side to product creation, product design. Um, and that kind of led to the things I was really interested in as a child was sport and then this graphic design, product design, uh, like construction kind of classes at school. That, that construction part, was that something that was apparent in your family as well? Um, my mom is a teacher and my dad is, a, is he, when, when he was younger, he was a really good athlete. So, I mean, there you kind of have the academic side and then the sports side. Um, my, on my dad's side, um, his, his father was a tailor mm. in uh, Jamaica. So I guess you have a little bit of that kind of construction, uh, craftsmanship mm. in there. But no, it wasn't like directly from, from my parents. But yeah, I mean, it's, I guess could be inherited from my grandfather. Right. Yeah. And, and how did it all start where, where you got fascinated into... For example, footwear. I mean, the construction part was already there, yeah, but yeah. then you had to apply it because of your interest in sports? Maybe? I mean, that was one thing for sure. I mean, when I was younger, I played a lot of tennis, a lot of soccer, as you say, here in Holland. And um, uh, yeah, so obviously understanding the footwear product that goes into those sports, the performance side, the functionality side of, of, of that, like uh, what makes a good tennis shoe, what makes a good um, soccer boot as well. So yeah, that obviously there was some interest there, but it wasn't specifically in in shoes at all. Really, it all started when I um, I did my masters in design engineering, mm. which is literally like the two worlds together in one. But the, why did you choose to study design engineering? Um, it's quite a direction already. Yeah, I mean, I did. I, that was my master's. So I did three three four years before that in a course called sports technology, 
which was a little bit, well, it was very open. I was part of the first wave of students taking this course at this university. So it wasn't as focused as, as, as I would like, you know. So at the end of the three, four years there, I was like, I knew I wanted to get into product in some way, but that studying wasn't, wasn't enough. I hadn't learned enough. And then there was a, a course I saw, design engineering, and it, you know, it does what it says in the tin, is a phrase in England, and like, it was literally what I was interested in, design and engineering, right. those two worlds together. So it was very directional, very, very um, specific, but I was also sure that's what I wanted to do, and that was what I was, I was mm. interested in. And during your studies, during your masters, mm. were you already interested in footwear or in sneakers no 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 i mean my my master's project is why i'm so interested in your stuff because my master's project actually was looking into um customizable protective equipment so using 3d scanning using 3d printing right. so i actually did uh, shin guards football football yeah shin guards protect your I did it. legs yeah exactly to, to, to protect your shins i did this with um with um umbro so I had this mobile phone app, and you could take pictures of the of the leg of, of my friend. He was my he was my case, mm -hmm. and um, then basically used that 3D scanned image on my phone, exported it to software, and designed a shin guard that I then printed out. Right, um, and I made different designs. So it, I was more actually in hard goods. But you ended up at Nike's. Yeah, so that was my first job. That's where the footwear story began. That's and how did you end up began. there? Because I can imagine, because it's such a huge brand, that yeah. it's kind of a dream job to, 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 go, to, to go and work there. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, where I'm from, you know, like, my dad, when he was, when he was younger, he had, a, he had a scholarship to America uh, when he, at 1920 for his athletics, and he was offered at that age... Uh, Nike running shoes and he was like no I'm good I, what is this brand I'm fine thank you you know <laughs> and like all these years on how big Nike's become it's I never I never would have imagined that I would get a job there so soon mm. but um one of my lecturers he saw the job application for a footwear developer on online LinkedIn or something and just told me to apply and I was like look I've studied nothing in footwear I haven't done one module one class on footwear I'm not going to apply. And he said, look, just, just apply. So I applied and three, four interviews later, I, I moved to, I got the job and I moved to Amsterdam to start in Hilversum. How come? I mean, what was it that people were interested in, in you without any experience in footwear I think, design? I think I was very fortunate in the fact that the hiring manager, Fabio, really good guy, at the time was looking for someone who didn't have experience, who was kind of raw, but interested in engineering and design that he could kind of mold and shape a little bit. So I was lucky in that, for, the, for, for that for sure. That's what he thought at that time, that's what he was looking for. And then just my sport background and my interest in product, you know, like at Nike, if you have a passion for sport, I mean, people ask me sometimes, how to get a job at Nike, just if you have a passion for sport and you, are, and you um, articulate that passion, then you, know, you can go um, a long way. So I think, yeah. What was the things. focus of your work there? I was really like a, a developer at Nike, so I wasn't really involved too much in the design part of it other than to give advice to the designer and like help them bring their ideas to life. And then I would take that, that idea and work with the, uh, work with the factory on bringing that idea to life and mm. materializing the, the idea. Um, I did two years in Amsterdam and where I really started to accelerate my learning was in Vietnam. Right. I did three years in Vietnam where I was working in the factories every day. How was that? Um, on a whole, I really enjoyed it because I'm, I'm a geek in that sense of learning how things are made, like back to when I was a kid and I was literally in the factories mm. every day, the sample rooms, the production lines, like really seeing how this product is made. And um, because you're also like in, in Vietnam, there's so many factories, Nike makes all of the, all different types of product there. So from football boots to running shoes, to lifestyle, to the, to the height beast stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like everything's made there. So I learned how to make all this kind of product, all the different machineries, the materials, the applications, the process, even the business side of it, the money that goes in, 
Um, Did you also involve yourself with the sustainable part of... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's impossible not to as well. Right. Like that, also, that's the everything you learn, like even the pattern efficiency targets and, um, yeah, what sustainable targets you need to hit, material vendors that work in a sustainable way. So, mm. you know, being that close to... To the source in because that way. there's quite a lot of criticism now of, of the big companies working in you know uh, low wages countries and, and and do you think that 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 they are responsible yeah I mean I would say I, I would say on on the big scale that they are working at now they've been doing things in a sustainable way for a long time already like they have even on like a micro scale like a pattern efficiency target you know like this you know, the more, the least efficient your pattern is, the more waste material you have and the less mm. sustainable the shoe is, right? So they've had these kind of things in place for years. But of course, with the recent, you know, social um, changes, you know, like these kind of companies have definitely had to really increase and, and up their game. And it's something that, you know, they probably could have started at this level sooner. But you see how, they, how they're moving now. And they have the resources, they have the knowledge, they have the techniques where they can really make this happen. But they have been doing things like Nike have been recycling rubber for, I don't think they had did their, their re, the recycle thing in rubber for like a good five, ten years already. So what project that really shaped you as a... As I, think, a I think where I really realised, I mean, there's a few projects like on the technical side, like uh, in, in football, um, the boots, like this is one of the, this is actually a lacrosse boot mm -hmm. um, for America. But um, the technicality of like football boots, lacrosse boots, like where millimeters matter, you know, for fit and performance. Um, I learned a lot on just the technicality of making highly technical product. But then I guess on a business side, um, within Areti, within what I do now with mm. the off-white project, I did three shoes from the off-white project. I worked on three of those. That's when I kind of realized the business side of it in terms of, um, you know, I could do this myself, work with these kind of brands and, and provide like product yeah. of this kind of thing. And also just starting to see that really increase in trend of collaborations between fashion brands and yeah. sportswear brands. Um, and we'll talk a little bit yeah. more about Areti later, yeah. but um, you also worked with Ref Simons. Ref Simons, yeah. yeah Ref Simons. Yeah. And um, can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what did you... Do that, and can you tell us a bit about the process, about the collaboration? So that that was my first project under Areti, mm -hmm. under the under the company. So um, yeah, I mean that this was just a case of right place, right time. Right? How did Literally. it ex come about? Because yeah, I just I left Nike uh, end of October two thousand and eighteen. Yeah, October two thousand eighteen. I moved back from Vietnam two thousand and nineteen, and then I just started reconnecting with some friends, and then. A friend of a friend um, put my name forward for, um, yeah, Raf, Raf was talking with an old friend that he did production with like 10, 15 years ago. And this friend is a friend of a friend of a friend. <laughs> so, Full network. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Honestly, yeah. the layers is yeah. just mad. So, um, yeah, and when I moved back, I was talking with the friend. He told his friend of a friend. And then we came to the point where... Um, my name came up in this conversation where Raf was saying, look, I want to start my own footwear line again. I'm leaving Calvin Klein. The Adidas uh, partnership is, 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 is over. And then, yeah, my name was put into that mix. And this was like, I left October back in November. This is happening like March, April. So like three, four months after I've left and moved back from Vietnam, I'm in, I'm in Antwerp having this conversation with Raf and then... Was it all networking? Was it luck? I mean, you said say, right time, right place. Yeah, but yeah. If, if people are watching and, you know, are thinking about starting for yeah. themselves, what advice would you give them? I mean, of course, you have to, you, you have to work hard and there is, a, element, there is a, a lot of element to, of luck. Anyone that's been successful or had some success, there's luck along the way, right? But you can make your own look, like you can create your own look through, through your work ethic, your talent, your, your approach. And obviously network is key as well. Mm. You know, like experience and network combined go, go um, a long way. So I would say like, add to your experience, have a, have a, don't be so focused on your experience, have, have like a range of experiences. 
doesn't have to just, if, if you're in the world of product, don't, you don't have to focus on just one product. You can be open and, you know, you'll learn, you learn many things from, diff, from working in different product fields. And the process of creating, of designing, of developing, of engineering, those steps are the same, really, regardless of the product. Yeah. If it's a car, if it's a shoe, um, if it's a bag, you know, the, the, the fundamental steps right. are, are, are similar. You know, so you can apply that that learning from different product into different products. So I'd say to be open and um, use your network, have mm. conversations, put yourself out there. That is very important. Yeah. What's your main focus with Areti? Um, I mean, it all started out as basically wanting to provide a platform, to provide a service that made the made the footwear industry less less complex um, easier to get into easier to be a part of like the it's such a complex uh, process the mm. you know the creation of footwear the design the engineering opening molds finding the factory the right material vendor the the, the environmental aspect as well um, so just removing the barriers there that was kind of that was that was the that's how it began. Just create, creating this this platform that removed those barriers, and you right. work with, with me and my team. Um, you know, it's not just myself. I have two very talented uh, d designers who also work in the team. Um, so if you work with us, we provide that similar platform, that similar infrastructure that you would get if you worked mm -hmm. with a Nike or a Converse or. Or but you, or you are kind of a middleman. Yeah, exactly. We're like the satellite team, yeah. you know, where where we would we, we can provide you with that same infrastructure that you'd get if you'd work if you do a project with Nike or Converse or Vans or whatever. Because I also have a production partner in mm. Hong Kong, and that's who I work with on every project. So we have a very stable infrastructure in that sense. Right. So yeah, it was just really to provide a creative platform, and then for me as well. Personally, it was also for me to build something where I could, I could uh, play multiple roles in the process because at Nike, I was very much, you know, such a big company, it's very structured. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was three years in Vietnam, I'm becoming a specialized, only an engineer developer, but I'm also interested in, in design, in, in, in materials, in merchandising, in marketing. So it was also about creating creating something for me where I yeah. could I could play in these multiple roles and and do multiple things and, and fulfill myself. And that also evolved in you being part owner of Athletic Footwear. Yeah, footwear. yeah. So this this is this is founded by originally by this is the friend of the friend that put <laughs> me in touch with the Raf Simmons project. Right. So that's how that came about. So. Uh, 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 um, Chris is his name. He's a really good guy. He founded a company called Sneaker Boy from mm. Australia mm. Uh, many years ago. And then a few years ago, he started Athletics. And I came on board um, the beginning of 2020. And what's your role there? So my role there, yeah, because now I'm, I'm a part, I'm a, I'm, I have a small ownership in it as well. So this is an example of a brand where I really can play across the board, uh, work closely with uh, with. Um, uh, um, Chris as well. Mm. Um, so my role there, yeah, I support in the design. We, I do the engineering, uh, the construction, the, the, the development, the material selection. Also work with you do them everything. On, yeah, work <laughs> with them on some. But not even. Uh, but do you still work on the technical side or the technical engineering of, of, of athletics? Yeah, well? I mean that is that that is one of my core yeah, right. roles within athletics is to is to engineer the product. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for now. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting and you're yeah. not leaving, but I'd like to know more about Esme as well. Um, we mentioned a little bit sci-fi artists. It's, it's a label to, to describe your work, but your yeah. work's quite diverse. Um, can you tell me about your first project? Because that's where we got to know each other, yeah. each other as well. And it's called Second Skin and it yes. really set the tone for your work. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Uh, yeah, it was actually uh, a school project because I was still studying. And um, yeah, so it's kind of, it's more different, I think, than what I make now. But um, the message was about the censor, the censorship of Instagram, about mm -hmm. the nipples. Um, so yeah, I think that yeah, project... Yeah, we have to give a little really, bit of background because yeah. in Inst on Instagram there was quite a discussion about yeah. showing nipple and yeah. you know how to use sexuality. Yeah. And the strange part is that 
female nipples were censored because yes, they, yeah. those were too sexual or considered to be more mm -hmm. sexual and male nipples weren't, weren't uh, yeah. censored at all yeah. because that hasn't got anything to do with sexuality and that's where exactly. you protested against right yes yes and um for the project for the school project they um asked you to choose a subject an online subject um or a digital problem and um, I worked with a friend of mine and um, we chose this, this, this subject and they asked to design a product, a product uh, fictive, um, to sort of solve the problem mm. um, in a fashion way or design way, like not literally, of course, to solve it. So yeah, that, this was the product. And, and what, you, what did you create? Because it was a second skin. Yeah, it was it was a copy of our bodies. Um, so we made a mold of our bodies and then we poured latex or we brushed latex in it. So it was a sort of an exact copy of our body um, in a sort of nude skin tone colors, but not all the details, of course. Um, and yeah, the Instagram uh, rules say that if you are posting uh, a photo from a sculpture, from a copy of a body, <laughs> then it's okay. Mm. So the idea was to sort of give people the the way to show their bodies, but then in a sculptural way that you can wear. Yeah, so then it was, was okay to post it. Exactly, and it was really weird because it's an exact copy of the yeah. body, including the nipples, but because yeah. it wasn't the real skin, but you know, exactly. created skin, it, it was accepted. And it, yeah. was, it was really interesting to, to, to describe the dilemma in that sense yeah. and to, to, to show that it, you know, the rules are very arbitrary. Strange, already. yeah. Where did your fascination with the human body start? Or with the female body, to be exact? Well, it's a good question. A lot of people always ask that. And uh -huh. I don't think it's something that I was always thinking about when I was younger or that it was my fascination. But... Um, I think it started when um, I was studying and it was a very popular subject to work with on my school. And I think a lot of people probably, probably recognize that. And um, yeah, it was, a sort of, it was a sort of trend at our school to maybe find yourself or experiment with your own body. And um, I think this was the first time I tried that for the first time. And um, can, we describe, can you describe what we see? Yeah, these are um, all the, the, the copies I made, or all the latex copies. And those are of your own body? Yes, yes. It was also, I think, um, at art school, it's very hard to make big projects. So you always work and use yourself. Mm. It's the most easiest way, but it's also, um, I think you can also learn a lot about it. Um, and for me, it was also, I'm not a fashion designer, and my study was also not about fashion design. So I was already a bit more into sculpture, but also into fashion. So it feels like it's a good fit, like it's the most logical to me to use the human body then as a sort of lens. That. Yeah. So I think, yeah, after all that time, it, it is a fascination of me, of course. But um, yeah, it came. Uh, so the same question that I asked Miles, I would like to ask you as well. What is the project that shaped you most? I think um, I think a couple of projects. Um, I think the projects I like most, so it feels um, it's most me, are probably the the project with I did with Gentle Monster, um, but also the the artist collaborations. And Gentle Monster, you were asked to create glasses no they're not yeah. spectacles are there what are the sun, sun shades well, what are they well yeah they, they sell <laughs> um glasses and uh -huh. um they asked for uh, for a certain project they asked nine designers different designers to make your own version or idea of um wearable glasses wearable arts mm -hmm. um based on eyewear of course um, so yeah, th this was mine and they got a lot of, they give you a lot of freedom and we worked on this, I think for a couple of months. So I think that's also the reason that it feels like a typical product for me because I had a long, I had a lot of time to work on it. And most of the time when I work with people, it's like very, very short deadline, yeah. only a couple of weeks or a couple of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then you have to think more about practical things like, uh, the time you have, the material that is the most fast. Yeah. Uh, shipping, so all the projects that have 
a longer <laughs> time frame are... Can, can you tell me a little bit about the philosophy of the eyewear that you designed? Because it's not always functional, quote unquote. Yeah, well, this is not functional, of course, <laughs> and you have to close your eyes to sort of wear it. Um, but here I try to, like the brand is very based on technology and innovation, the eyewear brands, um, and I'm into that as well. <laughs> So I was trying to make a sort of idea that it looks like it's digital or sort of liquid animated style, but then in a in a real way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it, yeah, it was hard to, to do it, but that was the idea behind it. Right. Yeah. And you also collaborated with uh, Septalisa? Yes. Yeah. What was that collaboration about? Um, yes, that one was, I think, in... 2017, right after my study, or maybe during my study, and um, she contacted me to ask to work together. Who and is she? Seth Lisa. Yeah. She, uh, she's an artist, a music artist, and she makes beautiful music mm. and more. Um, and she asked me to work together without a plan. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very nice project because also with this one, we worked on it for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea was that um, because before she was making music, music, she was into sports and um, she has a very nice strong body and she likes that as well. And um, we were thinking about making that a sort of bigger because a lot of people were complaining about that, those type of bodies, like very muscular bodies. And a lot of people think that it's not for female and it's too um, yeah, more a man kind of body. Mm. Um, so we try to come up with a project that sort of make that even bigger. Like, yeah, yeah. exaggerate that in order. Exactly. To, yeah, that's because in your work for. you try and question things that are very common in a sense. You, 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 you it's, it's, it's got this philosophy, philosophical background in order to question our surroundings in a, in a bigger sense. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that is correct, yeah. And in, in that, that, what, what's interesting there as well is that you talked about collaborations. Collaborations really yeah. function well if you really have the time. Yeah. And there, all of a sudden, you get a telephone call from L.A., you know, <laughs> where, where you can make from the from the people from Cardi B, and what yeah. did they ask you? Um, yeah, that's funny because um, only this project and I think the gentle project, gentle monster project, were the only one we had a lot of time. But besides that, it's always very short, like a couple of days or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I'm used to it now. Um, so I'm always checking my email late at night because most requests come. Doesn't, don't come from the Netherlands, of course. Um, and it was from LA, so it was still afternoon there. And I was already almost sleeping, and I was just checking my latest emails, and then I got a request from the stylist from Cardi B. Uh, it's always from the, from the stylist. Yeah. Not from never herself. herself. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, always the stylist. Uh, yeah, and they um, asked me to make an outfit custom for her new video. How did they got to know you and how did they know your work? Was that explained? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I always ask me the same. Um, but I think, yeah, of course, Instagram mm. has a big role in that because... And what I was the request? Because that was very short notice, probably yeah. a couple of days again. And what was the request? What was the brief? Well, uh, we called with them right after and they, they said um, that she... Um, had already a plan about a sort of transparent room or transparent setting. So she wanted to have something transparent and she had to think about this, this certain um, object. So that was nice to hear, of course. <laughs> that doesn't happen all the time. Um, so yeah, they asked me to design something transparent and that, that was it. So Besides that, that, it I came in late at night. How, many t how much time did you have in order to design it? <laughs> um, it was around Christmas. And I did it in two different parts because they have a lot of fitting. So I first made the upper part and then the lower part because the upper part was more important. Mm. But I think in total, maybe three weeks, oh, inclusive that, that shipping. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what happens a lot, especially if you work with celebrities, is that they either you loan them clothes or you donate them. What was the commission now? Because this was custom made for her. Yeah. Did you get rich from it? 
not rich, um, <laughs> but yeah, it it was a paid uh, it was paid, paid job, and did they paid well as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it was easier than uh, normal. <laughs> did, did you did project. you did you worry about representation as well? I mean, did you did you mind um, or did you have any control in how your work was being used in the in the clip and whether you know you, you that that was, that was something that you could agree on as well? No, not really. Uh. <laughs> Normally, I think you do, but that's more because a lot of people in fashion don't have enough money. So then you're trying to compensate and then you can say, okay, we can do this, but then I want this shot or we want it for the opening shot or this. Right. But here it, it was very different than um, I was used to because they already knew how they wanted to have the whole video. And there's, of course, a very big team yeah. and um, everything was already like plant and they gave me a lot of freedom to create it mm -hmm. so it was not that they already had in mind how it had to look or but it was from a shape. distance so that's quite difficult as well isn't it it is yeah because normally i would make a mold of someone's body yeah which is the easiest way of course because because then it's the the right the perfect fit so now we asked for a lot of sizes mm -hmm. <laughs> of our body we got like i think 20 or 30 different sizes and then i just try to sculpts her body with the sizes and from photos um yeah, yeah. on on gas <laughs> so that was the first thing i was looking at when the video came out like does it fit <laughs> and were you happy uh i was a bit critical in the beginning but i think it's normal mm -hmm. i was yeah but yeah i think it's uh it, it fits really good so uh, i was surprised actually a bit yeah. because was very nervous about it. Nice. And what happened in the slipstream of it? Is it this just an assignment that you get and you go on? Or does it have an effect on your other assignments or other clients? Um, yeah, I do think so. I think um, after this one, I got a lot more requests from artists that saw the Cardi B project. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it doesn't feel very different than before. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people, the only difference is that people want something else right now. Mm. Like uh, in the beginning, they always ask for the same material or that typical transparent plastic material. And now they know the material because it was, yeah, a big artist yeah. had it in a video, of course. So now they want something else. So that's the only thing that's different. We want something else. And can you adapt to that as well? Are you ready to? Yeah, I prefer to, to yeah. make something else. The only reason that I made um, that kind of design uh, a couple of times is because of the time. Mm -hmm. It's the fastest thing I can make. Um, but and yeah, I prefer to make new things because for me, it's a sort of nice way to experiment with new designs and materials, yeah. but for other people, because otherwise you also have to pay it yourself, yeah. which is very well, expensive. What you mentioned now is, is interesting because what you do with the assignments, the commissioned assignments, is to buy time for yourself yeah. to make your own work. Can yeah. you explain how you do that? Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's, um, yeah, I think it's, um, again, it's probably because the fashion world doesn't have a lot of money or not all of them. So that gives you more freedom, I think. I think if you have like a very maybe good paid project, um, there's probably uh, a more specific plan in forehand. But I always, um, I'm always surprised by it, but I always got a lot of freedom. Most of the people are like, okay, we want you to make something. It's have to look futuristic. This is the concept, but come up with something. Um, so I'm always try to use a certain idea I already had in mind or wanted to make, or I always know, okay, um, this is a material I wanted to work with or learn a bit more uh, about it. So then I just use pick that. one of the ideas I really want to make. It's also a big risk because it's always a first time you try something, of course. It's this huge experiment and yeah, the material it, it that is quite expensive as well. Yes. So yeah. there, was there a moment that you, that you felt that you failed miserably? Yes. <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> well, I had some projects that were a bit too experimental or maybe a bit of, yeah, a high risk to make, um, especially when you try different materials. I also worked with wax one time and... Um, <laughs> I thought it was sort of similar and I did a lot of um, tests, uh, smaller tests in the beginning, but like when you have to work with big sculptures, it's, 
it takes a lot of time and money to make the test version in the same size, of course. So you always do it smaller, but it doesn't work like that, that if you make it bigger, it works in the same way. It's mm. totally different. So I had a few projects that didn't come out um, and how so do well. How you solve that? Uh, <laughs> it's very stressful. <laughs> I always experience this as very stressful, <clears throat> but um, I think, yeah, I just try to, to, to make something else. I made something else one time. Mm. I changed the material. Most of the time it always works. And I think um, with my work, it's more easier because it's already very experimental. It's not very technical or a, a certain solid pro product. Um, so that helps, of course. And also because you get a lot of freedom, it's not there are very, yeah, a lot of rules like it has to look like this, this, this. So yeah, it's, it can still change, but um, there is some leeway. I had very stressful periods and I noticed that uh, for my latest projects, I don't choose like very different materials anymore. Just try to um, keep with, uh, <laughs> stay away with very different materials and try to experiment with the materials I already work with, but then different techniques. Yeah. It's easier. <laughs> it's much easier, I can imagine. Yeah. Well, to get to know you both a bit better, we've got this virtual mm -hmm. card deck that has questions <laughs> that will pop up randomly. Even mm -hmm. I have no control of it, which is quite difficult for me as a control freak. But mm -hmm. still, let's go to the card deck and you've got, a, you've got a choice of two cards and you can either choose left or right. So, Miles, we see the card deck behind me. Um, like I said, it's left or right. What, which one do you choose? Start with right. You start with right. Let's see what's on the right card. Um, yeah, how do you get in your creative flow best? Mm. Um, <laughs> damn, let me think about this. Have you got a creative flow or is it only... Yeah, I mean, I def definitely have like a, 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 let's call it like a, a comfort zone for being creative. Um, I would say like my environment, my environment is key. So I'm just actually in the process now of moving into, moving into my studio, into yeah. my first office. Um, so yeah, setting that up. So I guess for me, like organization, having like if I have an organized space, I have an organized, clear mind, I can allow my ideas to flow and to flow, to flow organically. If there's clutter, my mind is cluttered. I can't, I can't, mm. I can't flow. You know, I can't let it flow easily. How did um, you experience the, the past months or almost the past year where everything that we knew because of COVID has turned upside down? Yeah, I mean. <sighs> Uh, I mean, I guess for me, it kind of happened that right at the beginning of Areti and building my team, having having the I have one designer in London who's actually today is moving to Amsterdam, mm. and one designer in Paris. So we were kind of already working on, online, and we I didn't have a pre pre uh, pandemic period, if you, if mm. so um, so to speak. So I didn't know that to that point. I didn't really know another way. Uh, so. You know, for me, it wasn't too bad. But back to like the having an organized space, organized mind, working from home, working from my friend's office made that quite challenging. So I am enjoying now building this, building my studio exactly how I need it, how I would, how I would like it for this, you know, for a creative flow. So mm. also it smells like I always have incense on. So like this helps me relax and be at ease, having candles as well. So like for me, I... It's all about creating a relaxed environment that is organized, so I know where to go for certain things. Right. Um, so that, that helps me the most. And does the city mm -hmm. where you reside uh, influence that as well? Because we heard that you worked in Vietnam, yeah. London, Amsterdam. How do, yeah. those, how do those three compare to I each mean, other? Definitely the reason why I'm based in Amsterdam is because I feel most relaxed here as well. You know, mm -hmm. just being able to cycle around like my office, is in the north so yesterday beautiful morning i cycled to the office over the ferry you know just that kind of that kind of uh, commute to the studio in itself helps you be creative you're at ease you have the nature you have the water the the um, open air so definitely amsterdam as an environment for me to be creative and set up my base i, I really enjoy the city um and vietnam and, and london with mean, saigon is a i don't know if you ever I don't know if you've ever I've I've gone to Vietnam or one of the big Asia cities, but the energy is just insane, like crazy energy with the scooters and the street food and everything. So 
I mean, a different part of my life where I was doing something different, but for where we are now, I'm stand with the flow, my circle of friends that I have here, just that network again, the creative. I mean, we're here talking about creativity. There's so much creativity in this city. It's insane in all different fields, you know? I just find out about Esme, this, this, you know, and the work she's doing is insane. So um, just that as well. I mean, the creative flow, if you're around creativity, that also encourages that creative flow as well. You're not stuck because you're by yourself. Right. So a few things. Let's see the other card for Esme. What does the question <laughs> say on the other card? Have you ever gotten negative feedback on what you, uh, or what you do or your work and how do you deal with that? Yeah, a lot. A lot. <laughs> what not kind from of clients. Like not from clients, but no. from whom? People. Uh, the audience, so the to The audience, speak. yeah. And what, what is the negative feedback that you do get? I think uh, most of it was during the Second Skin projects, um, since that was about the naked body and censorship and... Uh, it also, I, I was expecting it, um, especially since there were a lot of articles online and it went a sort of viral on, on Facebook um, with a lot of, I always call it like sort of simple explanations or maybe a bit too simple and basic articles about it. Um, and yeah, that was, I think, the, the, yeah, the highest point of, of a lot of negative comments. And how do you deal with that if, you, if you're confronted with negative comments? I think it was uh, a, a good starting point. You were since quite young was, as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I was still studying and yeah. I think it was, um, I don't know, maybe beginning of 20 or something. Um, but yeah, I think um, it was very stressful, of course, and um, it was very difficult uh, with that project because uh, I didn't know, of course. It was my first project. Um, my first project online. Um, but yeah, like now I, I'm sort of used to it and I don't do a lot of similar projects anymore, of course. Um, so I don't get a lot of negative comments, but sometimes on social media, for example, um, with the Seth de Lisa um, suits, mm -hmm. I um, had it again because this is actually funny because I was uploading a close up photo, we just saw it uh, on the screen and people thought that um, it was real so that I was using it as a sort of implant uh, for my body to um, look more muscular. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of, yeah, this, this, it was this photo. Uh, so a lot of sport accounts or fitness accounts were reposting this photo like all over the world and were complaining or asking this subject, like, is this okay? Like, and uh, then I received a lot of messages from uh, people that were saying that I <laughs> I had to fitness and that it was the easy way and that, yeah, it was uh, interesting. But also, yeah, it was very interesting to and see that. And what happened with you if, if you if you read those comments and they interpret it in a way that you never meant it to be, what does it do with you as an artist or as, as a creative? Well, with, with this one, it was, um, it, it was mostly very interesting because it wasn't the truth. It, it wasn't an implant. So I mm. think that is a different, of course. So it doesn't feel very personal then. Um, so this was more interesting to see that people, um, yeah, they don't like it if you do it in the sort of fake way, which is also interesting, I think. But with the second skin project, it was more personal because they were complaining about the design itself and the message about it. Um, so that was hard, but I think um, I, remember that back then I was always asking my boyfriend to read all the comments because I wanted to know the reactions of people because that was also part of the project, of course. So he was reading it first and then it sounded more like one step away, which made it easier to adapt, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think nowadays it's, it's more easier. It's, it's, yeah, I don't feel it's very personal, so that makes it easier. And, Maybe also because I'm not the, the head subject of my project anymore. And that was, of course, the thing with the Second Skin project. Right. Yeah, yeah. It was about you. It was your body that yes. was copied. And, and then yeah. it, it yeah. feels more personal if Definitely. people comment on yeah. it. Yeah. I can imagine. Did you ever have to deal with negative feedback on your work? Yeah, I mean, in, in the same way. One thing, one thing, like, I mean, when I was at Nike, you're behind this huge organization. So nothing ever hits you if someone... If consumers have a negative thing to say about the product, 
there's so many layers between you and, <laughs> and that it doesn't doesn't bother you so my first experience for sure is under my own company you have a real personal uh attraction to the product you know so yeah i, w I had my first my first uh, experience of that if you like with the with the Raf Simmons collection because of course for me it was a big moment and i'm putting my name and my company behind that as who we are so yeah i mean but what happened what, what i mean i would just say like um it's it's surprising what uh, how people can view your work, you know, like what their opinion of your you you never see it yeah. <laughs> in that way, and they interpret it in that way, and it's like wow. Um, so at first you can take it personally and be like, what was the content of the feedback? Be a bit, what, what did you I mean hear? within within the footwear game now? It's like whatever you create. There's always someone that will say it's it's a copy of this or right. it's a version mm -hmm. of this, yeah. and you know. In reality, now there's so much product in the world, so much has been done that already exists. It's very difficult to completely 100% create something that is individual and brand new by itself. You're always going to be inspired and take elements from something that existed from whatever era it may be, from the recent era to the you know early 1900s even. So, you know, so that is that is just a reality and. I mean, at first I was I was upset by it because you know you're proud of your work and you're excited to show it and and people to receive it and interpret it in that way is quite surprising. Yeah. But and then, how do you deal with it? Well, you just I mean, for me and I think for you as well, you realize end of the day it's just like this. You feel you feel confident about the work that you've done and you know the the root inspiration and mm. why it exists yeah. in this way. And end of the day, that's all that matters. If if you can stand by, behind that and you're proud of that. And there's going to be people who love it and people who hate it. And c'est la vie, it's fine, you know? Like, it's really, it's really okay. I, it's, not, it's not for everyone. Yeah. Um, But I can you know? imagine that it's surprising if, if it, it's a bad thing you never noticed in the process yeah. yourself. Yeah, I mean, I mean, things like how people will say, ah, this is a version, this is a copy of this. Did you agree with and, them in the and end? It's, well, I mean, afterwards I look and be like, mm, I, I, see, I can see some elements there, but it wasn't, I tell you, it was never on a mood board, <laughs> it was never in my mind, it never, yeah. it never existed in our early ideation. Yeah. And then now to say, it's like, it's a copy of this, you're like... I mean, but it, like I said, it's really, it's fine. It's yeah. really okay. And it's, it's not for everyone. And for those who love it, great. For those who don't, it's okay. And some of, the, some of that comment, especially for me being like technically minded, if it's a functional feedback that, you know, it doesn't fit well, it's not comfortable, yeah. this material is hurting me, et cetera, et cetera. I need that information. Tell me all of that stuff. Yeah. That I read, that I take on board, and I learn. And next time, and the sometimes product... it's about taste, and yeah. then you can't discuss Ta yeah. taste. That yeah. it's really the, everyone has different tastes. Everyone has different right. opinions. So Th there's a there's a that next subject yeah. that I want to touch because it's creating artistic freedom within the realm of commission. How do you negate artistic freedom with a commission? Is is that is that possible? It's difficult. It is it is difficult to put like value to put a price on on your on your work is is challenging. Mm -hmm. But I think again that comes with time. That comes with experience. Like knowing your value and what you're comfortable with. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but even if the brief is formulated in a certain way, and you have to exercise. You know, you have to to to, to do what the brief says. Yeah. Um, how do you create enough room for your own? creativity for your own development as yeah. a creative i mean for me that's quite easy in the sense of i basically built our project calendars based off the nike project calendars you know like at nike you have almost a year and a half to create to create product in the fashion world that's like impossible like the first collection for raf we did in six months yeah but i was in asia for like three four months solid like making that stuff so um It's about, for me now, we find a middle ground. So six months is impossible. Mm. I nearly died making the first, the first collection. Um, one and a half years is not possible for the fashion world. It's too long. So we find a middle ground. And as long as we can stick to that, then I have enough. And what is the middle ground exactly? Yeah, about nine to 12 months. Nine to 12 months. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit, an overview, yeah. about the process from you know, idea to design to engineering to... Results. It all starts with basically like a brief. I mean, I, like I said, the creation process, regardless of the product, is mm. kind of the same, right? So 
it all starts with a brief. Like how, a how specific is the brief? Is it honestly, down to colour? Is it down no, to design? No, no. Honestly, it's really down to down to who you're working with. For example, with with Raf, he's, he knows exactly what he wants, so he gives very clear references. This is the direction that I want to go. These are these are the reference images, you know. And then together we have a conversation about that brief, and we share the ideas that me and my team have about okay, where where can we take this? Um, so yeah, it starts from a very clear brief reference from the from the client from the brand, and then from that we make um, we go and do our research. So we build a mood board, some concepts, mm -hmm. some ideas. We present that back, and you have a few rounds of this kind of thing before you begin to actually sketch out designs. But isn't it isn't it weird that I mean basically you do all the work and he takes all the credit for it. I don't see it that way, to be honest with you, because still, still the the idea, the concept, the vision, still mm. originally comes from comes from them, and I can't take credit for that. You know, like Raf, for example, I use his him, him him as an example as well. Again, it's his vision, it's his it's his idea that we are executing. You know, we're helping that vision come to life in in footwear form mm. and for our work we do take like I, f I mean raf simmons we work with raf simmons and it's known I'm, i'm having this conversation with you now because you know i work with raf simmons so that is where so that's my plus you know mm. i i win there i'm not too i don't i don't take it personally at all it doesn't bother me at all that i don't take credit for for the for the, for the idea for the, it's not my idea it's not my vision it's his it's his but vision but it's your execution but i take pride yeah. in being able to execute it at the level that we do right and that's what i'm proud for and that's what is seen in the market and when people see okay the quality of the product is good the design is nice it's comfortable like it's if, if people really enjoy it i take that's where i take my pride And I have the pleasure of working with someone like Raf, who has such a vision and has such ideas. And I know, I know. This you know, sounds all too politically correct. Yeah, When is it time for your own brand and your own brand of shoes, uh, footwear to, 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 yeah, to again, be introduced? Ag again, to be honest with you, I really enjoy the function that we have because we get to work with multiple brands, right? Mm. So... Right now, we're working with five brands. The next two brands that we just started with, I can't say the names now, but I'm so excited to work with these two brands. Um, so we have each time a slightly different brief, a different challenge, a mm. different uh, um, creative problem we have to solve. And that I really enjoy. So for now, I don't really have any interest in having my own brand because I really enjoy working with these multiple brands at this level that provide you a, a creative stimulus all in different ways each time. Right. Um, maybe one day, never say never, but for now, I'm in no rush. <laughs> Esme, um, people approach you for who you are and what you design personally. Can you imagine that you, were, that you would work or design for a bigger brand where your name is you know, taken off the list and all the, you know, the, the, the creative ex execution is yours, but the label is that brand? Can you imagine hmm. work to work like that? <laughs> Not sure, <laughs> but I think it's more because um, I think the, the the most typical thing about my work is the idea or more the experimental idea behind it or outcome and not really the technique or yeah, maybe of course also the technique and the materials. But um, I think if you, um, if you do it in that way, maybe your technique um, has to be... Um, a typical style for you or your yeah sort of sign or mm. style um yeah and i don't think it's it's for me or maybe not now mm. but um yeah i like i like it this way <laughs> if, if you talk about technique it's something that you're that you're pioneering you know developing still yeah um do you notice that other people copy your technique or copy your work in a sense mm, not really the technique i think because Also, the techniques that I use are um, a lot of people use it, and there are common techniques um, in a certain uh, corner of the creative. Uh, I think, um, but yeah, I notice, of course, um, people that follow you or mm. you come across on Instagram that um, are maybe more beginners, but um, have sort of similar objects uh, or maybe more than <laughs> just bonds. Yeah, I notice that, but. Um, as long as they are beginners, I don't mind. Mm -hmm. Like I also want to stimulate people, and 
it's nice to see they use you as an inspiration. Um, but I think it will only be more a problem if you can see that another designer does, that is more uh, known um, copies you, of course. But it, it, it didn't happen um, yet. Yet. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not, I'm not that difficult. Like, as long as you use techniques that other people also can use, it's not that I have a secret uh, and don't want to tell people about a certain material or technique. Like, they're all known. I just combine them in a different way. That's uh -huh. how I see it. We've almost entered the final phase of our conversation. Um, final question. Um, if, you, if I were to invite you back here again in five years, where are you then? Ooh, good <laughs> question. Um, I, 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 uh, I don't really know, to be honest, because I did have, I always had this idea that we would be, I wanted to create this studio that was small and niche. We had like a killer team. And, um, you know, we, we were known as the, the secret studio behind the scenes of all of these brands, these projects that we create for. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we're, get, we're getting a lot, of, a lot of requests and a lot of interest from brands that I didn't think would come this soon. So, really, I'm just at a stage where I'm just going to go with the flow and see, and see where it goes. Um, if you're bigger, will you still be in Amsterdam? I th yeah, I think so. I because no, I, I, I understood yeah. from the, the, the head, the, the director of, of Max, the clothing designer, yeah. that yeah. his biggest mistake was to stay in Holland when it grew. I had to. Yeah, but the thing is, for us, is I'm not reliant on Amsterdam, the Netherlands, to provide me with clients, to provide me with work. It's, it's a base. Right. You know, it's a base for us to work from. We work, we work with brands in Antwerp, in Milan, in London. Um, uh, that's it. For, yeah, um, and a few others. So yeah, I'm, and, and the Netherlands. I'm, so I'm, my base is not irrelevant, but it's I'm not relying on the area to create to give me work. And what's yeah. the next project that we can expect from you? So we have um, for MCQ Alexander McQueen. We have this coming out in May. Wow. Um, second season for RAF is coming out in ten days, something like this. Third season for RAF will come out in in September. Um, athletics, we have, I don't know, about three or four new styles coming through this year. That's quite um, a lot. Yeah. But the, the, the rhythm of yeah. presenting new new work is still continuing, even though, you know, shops are closed because yeah, of COVID. I think the, Yeah, I think the game has just changed. Yeah. You know, the game, the game has totally changed, obviously, to be online, to be really um, um, creative with how you, how you, you know, show your work online, how you sell your products online, mm -hmm. how you engage with the consumer yeah. online. So the game has just changed, but also we're working on projects. So um, we'll work, we just started now with the two new brands that I'm excited for, for Autumn Winter 22. So that product will release next, uh, yeah, next July, August, September period. So by that period, obviously, the brands and the stores are hoping that things are better. Yeah. So that, that definitely helps us in the fact that we are always working a year, a year and a half ahead at a time when the brands, our clients, are hoping for the times will be, will yeah. be easier. So right. that helps us. Esme, same question for you. Where will you be in five years' time? Yeah, a good question indeed. <laughs> but um, I think for me, um, the things I want most for now are um, I think probably a bigger studio mm. and maybe surrounded by more people or having a team and not just making everything myself because that's really hard and impossible sometimes um, yeah I, I really hope for a bigger studio with 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 more um, involving more techniques and different ones because now it's it's very like a certain technique I always work with molds and a lot of materials but you can also work with 3D printers of course and scanning techniques and I really hope to incorporate that more in a bigger studio with a bigger team. Well, that's feasible in five years. <laughs> and what can we expect from you within the next couple of months period? Um, I'm not sure yet since all my requests always come <laughs> a couple of weeks in forehand. Um, so it's always a surprise, of course. Uh, I do have um, some projects with um, artists but I'm not sure if, if it will happen, but I'm also working on uh, making my own objects. So I'm not only doing collaboration, but also have a 
project or object myself that I can or sell or yeah something you have because you always give it away of course so I never have anything so that's what <laughs> I'm working on right now. We're very much looking forward to that. I thank you both for your inspiring stories and sharing your insights as well. And I thank you for watching. Uh, we've come to the end of the program. And um, if you're interested in more programs from Pakhuizen Zwerger, make sure to check the website because every day we've got several live casts that are can that can be watched. Um, if you would like to make a contribution to our programming in these difficult times, that is more than welcome. Please go to the swagger.nl slash pay and there you can leave a financial contribution that will benefit the programs directly. Um, keep an eye on the uh, agenda on Pakhuizen Swagger and we will be back on April 1st with a new edition of Uncovering Creatives. Uh, we hope to see you then. Thank you so much and bye-bye.